We have a, a couple of prayer concerns. Um, JJ Hobbs, who is three and a half old and the grandson of Larry and Julie Hobbs. Um, they were teachers in the community uh, schools here. Um, and he's had some medical problems and he's currently hospitalized. Um, and so prayers are being requested for him. Um, Robin, was it Harlan? Hartley? Robin Hartley was mentioned earlier this morning. Um, the 9-11 families and those who relive that tragedy. Um, we want to keep those in our prayers as well. And of course, all of those that are currently listed in our bulletin as well. I know that um, Beth Mosher continues her treatment. I talked to her this week and um, she seems to be doing pretty well and in pretty good spirits. So continue her in your prayers as well. Let us pray. Lord, you know those that we have lifted up this morning, and you know the struggles. You know the concerns, the pain, the grief. You know the hope and the faith and the desire of each and every heart. So, Lord, we ask that you be with each and every person in all of the emotions that surround the various things that we feel from day to day. When those that we love are hurting, when those that we care for are grieving, when those that we know and are friends with don't know where to turn and what to do and are at their wit's end, so Lord, we just ask and lift them up today that you would be with them. Lord, we have also come today to hear your words of healing and love and hope. So enter our hearts and our spirits and teach us to follow you. Give us the courage and the strength to be your faithful disciples amidst a broken and sometimes very scary world. Hold us when we cry, bring peace to our souls when we are anxious and afraid, and hope when we cannot see the road ahead. And now, Lord, we pray as you have taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture this morning is from Mark 27 to 38. Jesus and his disciples went into the villages near Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They told him, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, and what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus ordered them not to tell anyone about him. <clears throat> then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed, and then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and scolded him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at the disciples sternly, correcting Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives. What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. Good morning.
I saw a cartoon showing a man worshiping at the altar. But a stud of a cross on top of the altar was this huge number one lottery ball. And the man is saying the Lord's prayer, but closes with the words, for thine is the kingdom, the power ball, and the glory forever. Amen. My suspicion is many folks are praying, for thine is the kingdom, the power ball, and the glory forever. While whether America's economy is or isn't growing economically is anybody's guess, it's likely, though, a safe bet that our culture's growing addiction to gambling continues to fulfill a success by chance mindset. And you don't have to go very far to figure that out. Just take a trip to Anderson or easier yet, just hop online and you will find any number of gambling opportunities to whet your appetite that will offer you this idea of immediate financial success. Over the years, many cities of all shapes and sizes have been left with these huge holes in their economies. And as a result, they've seen gambling casinos and lottery tickets as their salvation. You can also just visit any number of local grocery stores today, gas stations, private clubs, and other stores, and look at what your opportunities are. I have stood in line in gas stations for four, five, six people buying their scratch-off carts. From Powerball to scratch-off to pull tabs, you can find any number of gambling opportunities, and the truth is they're turning a pretty good profit on the ticks. The Hoosier Lottery recently reported and recorded profits in the past year as its ticket sales soared 26% from the year before. That jump was fueled by a 27% growth in scratch-off ticket sales that accounted for nearly 80% of the 1.74 billion lottery revenue during the June 30th, when that period ends, um, that officials are telling uh, the Lottery Commission. This, despite most administrators of the lottery projecting a drop in sales due to COVID related shutdowns and the possible economic impacts. Nevertheless, the boost in revenue will result in the lottery sending a record. 375 million in profits to the state. In fact, Sarah Taylor, executive director of the Hoosier Lottery, recently thanked players around the state for growth. It's hard to believe it's been more than 30 years since that first scratch off ticket was sold. We're so proud of the more than six billion the Hoosier Lottery has given back to Indiana over the last 30 years, including money to the Teachers Retirement Fund and local police and firefighter pensions. We're very thankful. Additional revenues go toward vehicle tax education development, and that all sounds so very awesome. What brilliant marketing. Buy a scratch off and look what you're supporting good and noble things. Now, as a spouse of a retired firefighter, I should be thankful for such raving reviews. But the irony is, while most of the proceeds from state-run lotteries are used to fund such noble causes as pensions and education, the sad truth is, we would rather pay for a lottery ticket than approve a budget for adequate retirement funds for teachers, police officers, firefighters, and education. That's the sad truth. What's even sadder is while we hail the successes of the lottery, we turn a blind eye to the devastation. Even those who advocate for the lottery admit that there are downsides and it's pretty risky business. 
The threat of organized crime looms over the entire casino industry, and we become painfully aware that gambling can be as addictive and destructive as any drug or any alcohol. The problem is, when an economy is built on gambling, it quits producing goods and providing many necessary services. Furthermore, it impoverishes many communities, businesses, and families. I've seen the devastation firsthand that the boat brought to Michigan City and surrounding communities. When we took our trip just recently to West Baden and French Lick, and neither Mike and I, you know, we don't, we don't gamble, we don't play golf, we went to see the beauty and be in the nature, but I'll admit, the hotel is absolutely gorgeous, and it is full of glitz and glitter. But upon reflection, it's interesting. From the moment you walk in, all the gold and adornment and sparkle and shine subtly says, play the slots and go home with this. You can have it all. And although I didn't go inside the casino itself, I didn't have to. All I really had to do was kind of stand outside and watch. And you could see that the place was full of people who had sparkle and shine in their eyes, that elusive hope that I'm going to be rich. Most walked away with less than what they walked in with. And while it does happen, because while we were there, there was someone, the place was all a bit buzz that someone had run $700,000 just the night before. Now, I don't know if the guy lost it all before he left or if he took it home, but sometimes you win. And then there is our friend, and I'm going to call him Ernie. He had it all. He was a successful, successful man. He had a couple great homes, awesome family, cars, boat, travel, just about anything you'd ever, ever, ever want. He used to be a neighbor. If you went out with Ernie, you never wondered about the bill because he wasn't about to let you pay for it. He had it. And truly, he was a great guy. He was kind, considerate, compassionate, fun, an intelligent and successful man in every term of the word. But he also had a gambling addiction that he couldn't shake. And almost every single weekend, he was off to Michigan City or some other grand location. And he often won until he didn't. And then he lost everything. His reverse mortgage didn't do him much good after he gambled it away, lost both homes, a business, family, kids, and friends. And he just couldn't stop. Not even as he was looking at his last dollar. He played it, knowing in his heart, I'm going to win it this time. And when he didn't, he even gambled his car. And when it was done, he didn't even have a ride home. Went and got him. He didn't have a ride home. He had nothing left. Jesus asked, why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? It's true, as the Christian community, we often think, what is so bad about getting rich quick and cashing in on a ticket to success? Truthfully, it's a wrong question. The issue isn't whether holding a lottery ticket in one's hand or pulling the handle of a slot machine is right or wrong. The question is, what do we see as the measure of our success? What will we give in exchange for our lives? Is success really just about how much cash we can accumulate, power that we can wield, and the admiration or envy that we can generate for ourselves? Living in today's world, one would think so. It almost seems like we've adopted as America's tagline, it's all about me. It's all about me. It's all about me and my money and my power and my wants and my desires. It's all about my success. And in today's text, Jesus preaches a different measure 
of success. Jesus says, all who want to come after me must not, must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. That's how Jesus defines success. Instead of offering the disciples a successful ministry defined by the world's terms, he proclaimed and practiced a ministry of sacrifice. Instead of enthusiastically remarking about how much the disciples had to offer, Jesus asked the disciples, what can you give in return for the life you've received? Instead of promising the disciples that they would be winners, Jesus says, hey, guess what? Follow me and y'all going to be losers. In fact, Jesus' life from the moment of his birth to the death on the cross was in conflict with the world's ideas of power, control, and success. It was in contradiction with a world that said, it's all about me. Instead, Jesus' life was an invitation to repent, a call to turn around and go in a different direction other than the law of the promise of empty self-worth, power, and success. It was a call to conversion, to a whole new way of seeing and thinking and feeling and believing, which was so radical, it was like being born all over again. In fact, Jesus defined success as a discipleship and service, as following him into the broken masses of the world. So the real question might be, was Jesus a success and can today's text be our ticket to success? I think it can. Seriously, don't you think following Jesus is a better and cheaper investment than climbing the corporate ladder, manipulating your way to power, than gambling? Don't you think feeding the hungry would be a greater investment than a scratch card? Does anybody really want to disagree with that? Certainly, our time would be better spent loving our neighbor. Jesus lived in a small town. I mean, this was his success. He lived in a small town of little consequence. And his message was confined to a tiny segment of the population, the disciples were pretty slow to learn, they were quick to doubt, and they were better at running than they were at following. Jesus infuriated the religious and political powers that be, so his days became numbered pretty quickly. He was arrested, tried, and convicted by religious authorities, abandoned by his followers. He suffered a torturous death on the cross, and contrary to popular belief, Jesus' message became popular and spread to the ends of the world, earth only after his death, not before. So is Jesus' ministry a success? Yeah. Yeah. And he was successful because his life, ministry, and death resurrection was patterned after God's design, not the world's, not popular demand. Not a world that said, it's all about me. Because they did say that. If you don't do what we want, we're going to crucify you. And they did. And the message of Jesus Christ spread throughout the world because of it. Because Jesus put the things of God before the things of the world. Because Jesus' heart, mind, and soul were faithful to and focused on God thoughts, not human thoughts. The truth is, God's plan isn't, nor has it ever been, about our earthly success, trinkets, toys, and treasures, but about the love of one's neighbor and the eternal salvation of all of humankind. That's God's plan. God's plan is to see each human being reconciled to him. That's the plan. That's the overall plan. It's about Jesus sacrificing himself for the sake of the whole world, and Jesus called to you and I to do the same. God's plan for Jesus was to show us how to love our neighbors as ourselves, sacrifice himself on the cross so that all of humanity, you and I, could have life. Not a fake life, but a real life. 
Not a life defined by a ticket to Disney World kind of life, but a ticket to a real life defined by a life of sacrifice and discipleship and ultimately eternal life. What ticket are you selling? What ticket are we as the Christian community, as Christians every day, selling? When was the last time you talked about to someone who is giving up their life about the life and love Christ has for them. John Shea argues that the cross of Christ is always relevant in the sense that escape from responsibility is always attractive. Our responsibility is to make sure that the world knows that Jesus Christ loves them, does not condemn them, but loves them. Shea goes on to say, the cross on which Christ was lifted becomes the scale of justice which judges our actions and transforms our values. That Jesus was crucified for us, however, does not mean that we have been saved from crucifixion. That he bore the sins of humankind does not mean we do not need to repent. That he overcome the world does not mean that we can succumb to it. It means Jesus, the divine challenger, evokes responsible action in the world. In other words, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection means to evoke within us hearts that wish to emulate the life of Jesus Christ. But our failure to honor the cross's message of a Christ-centered, spirit-filled life has resulted in a self-satisfied, self-centered, and vacuous kind of discipleship that places personal preferences over mission, ministry, and the greater common good. Such preferences have resulted in the breakdown of our communities, churches, families, among other things you can add to that list. The truth is, in the never-ending pursuit for worldly success, we will only discover the poverty of success because we'll end up valuing the wrong virtues and things, and we will end up rewarding wrong behaviors. We end up saying things like, you know, someone's hard work really isn't as important as timing and location. Doing one's best isn't as important as knowing the right people or someone even learning from their mistakes, paying our bills and going to work and raising our kids and doing the right thing no longer affords integrity, honor, and respect. All that matters is how much stuff we have and how much money is in the bank and how much power we can wield. And if I won, in American society, climbing to the top of the ladder has become far more important than lifting the bottom and supporting the whole. Today, when someone asks about somebody's worth, there's a good chance that they're not asking about their integrity, their character, their values, their commitment to Christ. They're asking how valuable has this person been to our company, our community, our family, our school, our church. They're not asking that. They don't mean how moral of a life are they leading or how good of a parent are they. They mean, how much money do you have and what can you do for me today? Thank you very much. And it saddens me to say that sometimes, not always, but sometimes, we're not infallible. The church can be just as guilty. All too often, we define our successes not by service and discipleship, by, but by butts in the pews and money in the offering plate or the hours our members and staff spend in the building. Ironically, Jesus never called us Christians to fill pews. Jesus never called anybody to fill the, sang the, the synagogue. We aren't called to produce an income to fund a building or pay utilities or spend large amounts of time gathering in it. In fact, Jesus spent very little time doing any of those things. Frankly, 
to be the church of Jesus Christ, we don't need a building. We don't really need butts in the pews. We don't need that to offer hope to a broken world or to win people for Jesus Christ or to help a world that is gambling away its opportunity for eternity in, the, in a new life to come. I love the church. But the church is out there. What we do need is we need boots on the ground, hands that touch others with the healing ways of Christ, and hearts that reach others with God's gracious love. Jesus didn't do that sitting in the synagogue. Jesus spent his time discipling others, healing a broken world, offering God's grace and a grace that offered eternal life. When people came to Jesus, he touched them, he talked to them, and he healed them. He didn't run after them. They came to him. He had 12 disciples around him that he spent time with. And they wanted to spend time with him. And he taught them. And he trained them. And he sent them out to do the same. And I know that that's a tough message to hear. But we put a lot of stock. I don't care what church it is. We put a lot of stock in our beautiful buildings and having enough cash to pay the bills and very little energy towards showing others the love and grace of Jesus Christ and the eternal life that he offers. When was the last time you showed somebody that? Every year, about this time of the year, we're asked, how many professions of faith have you had? How many baptisms have you had? Who have you discipled? A large number of our congregations are writing a zero. Jesus' disciples and Jesus spent their entire ministry touching others' lives wherever they could touch them, whoever came before them, and when they came. That is what Jesus and the disciples who followed him spent their entire ministry doing, serving others, pointing them toward the kingdom living and eternal salvation. Oh, and consequently, because they were doing that, the church as we know it today was born, and it was born because of that. It was born because of people who pour, bore witness to a living God, an exciting God, and a God that just wrapped their arms around people and said, let me love you. And people were so excited and drawn because people were out there saying, do you know what Jesus did for me? Do you know? Jesus touched my life this week. Did you know that this prayer was answered? That's why we're here in the building today. Because that's what Jesus did. In today's term, it was born because of discipleship and service and those who gave witness to God's grace. And because of that, Jesus and the disciples' ministry was a success. Despite the fact they died for it. So when Christians ask, what about the church's worth? We ought to be measuring not butts and pews and money and an offering plate, but about our witness and our service. I'm not saying that, you know, our church isn't important or people aren't important and money isn't important to have. I know that that, that it is or we can't function. But it should not be our top priority. It should not be our top priority. Our top priority. Priority should be, do our people show the love of Jesus in their heart? Do they show sacrificial love towards others? 
Do we offer hope and grace to a broken world? Do we love God's people enough to offer them Christ who gives us life in the here and now and in eternity? And those should be our primary questions. We should be asking, how have you loved Jesus this week? How has Jesus loved you this week? You're welcome to talk back at any time. You can even put it in the chat. Because those are the most important questions. Because they are the questions that define success. We can never begin to experience the power of the gospel until we begin to see it as the gigantic contradiction of everything the world calls success and power. Until we begin to understand that there are places in our souls where coercion can never go. Until we realize that we'll never experience the power of God's love until we give up our love of power and preference and we'll never be successful as disciples of Jesus Christ or the church until we follow him in sacrifice and service until we lose ourselves. Each and every one. Francis Gere in The Silence of God, it's a little bit older of a book, but he writes that he had a friend who was hired by a highly competitive marketing firm, but his friend seemed to be showing signs of wear and tear, so he invited him to lunch and he said, you know, I'd like to know how your new job's going. And then he said, the way my job works is that when you get hired, you get 100 points. When you make a mistake, you lose points. If it's a small mistake, you lose maybe one point, maybe five points. If it's a big mistake, you might lose five, ten, maybe a little more. But when you get down to 80 points, they fire you and they hire somebody else. So his friend asked him, he said, so how do you gain points? And his friend looked at him in, with an expression of despair and replied, you can't. The Christian success story is this. Because Jesus denied himself and took up the cross every day, God gives you back all your points. All of them. No matter how many mistakes that we make in life, we always get back 100 points, and we never slip below 80. At the end of the day, Jesus always sets the score to 100. And you get to wake up to a new day with 100 points to try all over again. When asked about success, Ralph Waldo Emerson put it this way, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a better place, rather by a healthy child or a garden patch or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life is breathed easier because of you. If you've done that, you have lived, and this is to have succeeded. Jesus said, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news, will save them. What is your life worth? Let us pray. Lord, it is easy for us to say that we will follow you and then turn our backs and act as though our commit to you doesn't mean anything to us. Jesus, challenge us to take up our crosses and follow you. Help us to pick them up and to follow you. It isn't easy for us, but we do want to follow you. So help us lose our lives and lose them to you. Help us to actually put into practice the good news of your compassionate love and justice for all and heal brokenness wherever it may meet us and in whatever form it may greet us. When the people come, give us the courage to speak of you, to lay our hands on a shoulder and pray for them, to tell them of your gracious love for them. Help us 
to seek and learn of your will for us and give us the grace to step forward as your disciples, those claimed and called to be the church, those called to be the church in a broken world. Let us seek not our own success, but your success. Let us lose our lives in you. And now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all, may you go in peace. Amen.